what you do when you're an atheist is you collect I'm a good person points as a currency. Mm -hmm. And then you take that bag of I'm a good person money and you pay your conscience to shut up for a while so you can sin in peace. That's why atheists love arguing with Christians. That's actually a transaction they're getting from them. Yeah. They've, their conscience is bugging them. Conscience meaning cone science mm -hmm. has the word science in it. It means right. with knowledge. And so the Bible says that we have knowledge that we're sinners in need of a savior. But what we do is we garner I'm a good person points to pay our conscience to leave us alone yeah. so we can feel like a good person and then go about our sin. Right. We're really renting sin time from our conscience like a vending machine. Welcome to the Replace Your University podcast. I'm your host, Michael Lush. Thanks for joining us. And I've got here to my side also Michael. So we will now be known as Eminem. <laughs> Would you like to eat us? <laughs> so, Michael, you and I were talking off camera a minute ago about ayahuasca. I've had four buddies that just recently went through ayahuasca. And I started investigating it. And, you know, it was something that I, I kind of struggled with because I'm always looking for improvement. And yeah. all four of these individuals came back and said they would do it again. That, hey, this was a great experience. It was good and bad. Actually, one guy said it was the worst thing he did for two days. And then the next two days was the best thing he had ever done. So it was really this polar opposite. But they all came back and said, yeah, you know, it's improved the way I think. I have mental clarity now in my business and in my life and what I should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Actually, two of the guys that are prolific drinkers said, we're not going to drink this year. So that's a positive thing. But one thing I struggled with is, you know, as a Christian, you're this is a whole spiritual thing. Yeah. And some of the stories, and I'll let them share their stories, but it was like, that's exactly why I didn't want to do it. I don't want to be fighting with a demon for the next 30 yeah. minutes. And that was, that was a couple of their stories. So, you know, I, how, how do you feel about this whole ayahuasca trend that's going on and, and people doing it? Well, I think that, I think there's clinical evidence that shows that extreme emotions can cause Mm -hmm. um, behavior changes, behavioral regulation. Yeah. And so like, let's say a man doesn't want to quit smoking and he struggles with it for years because of the chemical addiction. Mm -hmm. One day his daughter comes in and starts crying and saying, I want you to be at my graduation. And he's like, what do you mean? I will be. And she's like, no, you're not. You're going to die because you smoke. Mm. That emotion, that high emotion can be used right. as a, as a means to, um, evoke some kind of re behavioral regulation. Yeah. And so when you do mind altering drugs, specifically like psychedelics, um, you're kind of bypassing that and tapping right into those heavy emotions. Yeah. And so you go through this extreme stuff, but then it, those extreme emotions can also cause you to come out of that and quit pornography, quit mm -hmm. smoking, quit drinking. And so it makes sense clinically that that is the case. Matter of fact, like LSD and these things were created yeah. as clinical drugs back in the day. Mm -hmm. They would dose people up and, and have a guided experience. Mm -hmm. And within like six hours, they could cure things that like dialectical behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy couldn't touch for years. What are those things? So CBT and DBT are yeah. the types of therapy that are used to mainly treat borderline personality disorder and um, bipolar. Yeah. But um, I actually think, so uh, I'm a medical doctor, and so mm -hmm. I uh, <laughs> I was kind of going to psychiatry. Yeah. But as a Christian, I actually kind of ran into a roadblock. Mm -hmm. And so I think that modern psychiatry more or less teaches you that your problem, the reason you're depressed is because you have a, a lack of self-love. Mm -hmm. And I think the Bible teaches that it's actually an overabundance of self-love. You love, you're so, you love yourself so much that all you do is sit around and think about how depressed you are. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I think it's inverse. And so I, I like to say that depression is just the inevitable result of the endless pursuit of unobtainable happiness. Mm. And that the meaning of life, therefore, is not the pursuit of happiness. It's the seeking of righteousness. Okay. We're not here to be happy. We're here to be made holy. Yeah. No, you mentioned that you were a Christian, but you, you had also mentioned that you used to be an atheist, too, which I think is a really cool journey and story of going from atheism to Christianity. So what was it that was this enlightening experience that made you say, yeah. okay, there, I, I wasn't made from nothing. I am not just stardust and these stars collided and here I am as an in, in, intelligent and obviously designed human being. So, and yeah, and that is the big question, right? Mm -hmm. is, is, is how do we figure out what's true and what's not? I think there's three questions. Is there a God? Mm -hmm. Which one is it? And what does he want? And so the first question, I was like saved when I was four years old, mm -hmm. but I don't think you're really like your faith is real until you lose it and kind of come back for yeah. your own reasons. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, med school, I was too busy, like, you know, doing drugs. Well, not heavy drugs, mm -hmm. cocaine stuff, but like smoking up every now and then, yeah. some, some psychedelics here and there. Um, and, you know, banging hot chicks and just trying to have a good time, you know? Yeah. And I realized that I had two different definitions of the word nothing. So it was, it was, there was actually a benefit to me to be atheist. Right. Because I didn't have these consequences. I didn't have this invisible dude telling me to stop sinning, right? Right. So and you had less guilt? Um, no, the guilt actually increased, but I found a mechanism to pay the guilt off. And so oh. what you do when you're an atheist is you collect I'm a good person points as a currency. Mm -hmm. And then you take that bag of I'm a good person money and you pay your conscience to shut up for a while so you can sin in peace. Yeah. And so what it is, it's really transactional. That's why atheists love arguing with Christians. That's actually a transaction they're getting from them. Yeah. They've, their conscience is bugging them. Conscience meaning cone science mm -hmm. has the word science in it. It means right. with knowledge. And so the Bible says that we have knowledge that we're sinners in need of a savior, but what we do is we garner I'm a good person points to pay our conscience to leave us alone yeah. so we can feel like a good person and then go about our sin. Right. We're really renting sin time from our conscience like a vending machine. And so I realized I had two different definitions of the word nothing. Mm -hmm. If you ask me what happens when we die, it's like nothing. Right. Well, define nothingness. Uh, what do you mean? There's yeah. nothing to define. But then when you ask, like, what, <clears throat> where did we come from? Well, we came from nothing. But that nothing has the quantum level, it has gravity, it has stardust, it has uh, all the, yeah, thermodynamics, yeah. energy, all this stuff. And I'm like, those are not the same nothing. And if the universe came from nothing, then it's scientifically possible that heaven could just come from the next nothingness that comes after we die. Yeah. And so I was like, man, it's like it, you start to catch your own BS after a while. Mm -hmm. And I realized there was a transactional benefit for me to be atheist because... Um, Essentially, you get to continue on in sin, not without guilt, but with, a, with the appearance of alleviated consequences. Yeah. And so I realized there had to be a God, and then I wanted to figure out which one it was. So I took seven years. I read all the holy Before books. Before you get into that, I, yeah. because you obviously come across as a very, one, cynical, so you question cynical, everything, yeah. which is a good thing. And I, we'll talk about conspiracy here, theories here in a second, because <laughs> I, I question everything. It yeah. doesn't make me a conspiracy theorist. I even question the conspiracy theories. Correct. Right? Uh, like, for instance, all Republicans are good and all yeah. Democrats are bad. Correct. No, that's not true. I question a lot of Republicans. Correct. So uh, you're obviously cynical, but you're also analytical. But one of the things that, that I was stuck on is science teaches us that energy cannot be created mm. nor destroyed. Yeah. So how do we come from nothing? And then if we die, if we are energy, then how do we turn to nothing? Yep. And isn't that counterintuitive to what science teaches us? It is. Our so, current understanding of science? Correct. Um, so this is this goes back to Genesis and mm -hmm. it goes back to thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. So thermodynamics has three rules. Three rules. One is that energy is not created or destroyed, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then it gets into entropy, right? Entropy is is molecules basically falling apart, going mm -hmm. from a high concentration of organized structure to a lower concentration of disorganized or chaos, mm -hmm. right? an increase in entropy. I think that Genesis 3 is entropy. I think the curse, I even define, and this gets, because, you know, as a medical doctor, it's like, you know, I'm expected not to believe in certain things, but right. I'm like, screw that. Like, yeah. it is what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I actually believe that modern medicine is the attempt to reverse, slow, or stop the curse of Genesis 3. I think we're all falling apart from the atomic level. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to glue ourselves back together quite fruitlessly. Mm -hmm. And I think technology, the advance in technology is, is actually a crutch for the de-evolution of the human intellect. For instance, a lot of people like to say that the Bible um, isn't considered accurate until it was in writing because then it, it, but those same people then say, but the writing's inaccurate too because yeah. there's all these, it's like, well, which one do you, you know, the truth is, the truth seems to be um, that the oral tradition that predated when Moses in the seventh generation from Adam wrote, like, wrote um, the first biblical canon transcripts, mm -hmm. it seems like it was actually more accurate before it was written, which people are like, how could that be possible? How could it be possible? Because they think of it as a telephone game. Yeah. But the way encryption... The closer you are to the actual event, the more accurate it is, and the further away, the less accurate it is? Not just that. Even assuming that even assuming that the the text and the, the verbal were exactly the same, the way you decrypt or encrypt something is to pull apart the literal and the actual meaning, mm -hmm. ship them in different containers, and then combine them back so mm -hmm. they make sense. When, let's say... Um, I have a child, right? And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm Adam, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm teaching Abel the Bible yeah. or, or at least this, what's happened so far. God, you know, we got here. We just woke up one day. God put me to sleep, took a rib, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, all this stuff. Well, 
when I would tell him the literal content of what happened, then I would say, now, what does that mean? And I would ask him the actual interpretation of the literal content. Mm -hmm. And so it was locked together to where you would pass on the, the, not just the knowledge of how, but the wisdom of why. Mm -hmm. And so you had knowledge and wisdom kind of combined. And so when we have literature or just the liter literal, right. right? Now everyone can make up their own actual interpretation, which is where we get all these denominations. Mm -hmm. And yep. so we've lost half of the Bible just in it just in the fact that if a kid didn't b agree with the interpretation, yeah. you wouldn't teach him the next sentence. You mm -hmm. locked those together. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty much. So you went through, you said seven different religions or you analyzed through the seven different religions? No, I'd say I, I bounced. I, I was like raised Christian, mm -hmm. did the atheist thing for a while. Um realized there had to be a God, mm -hmm. and I, I was like, now, so that's the first question, is there a God? And like we said, there kind of has to be, right? right? Um, and I realized that the human intellect was falling apart. Like, we're not evolving from atoms, we're devolving mm -hmm. from atom. Mm -hmm. And the increase in Ooh. technology... Let me repeat that again. Yeah. We're not evolving from atoms, we're devolving from atom. So Are y'all yeah. getting the, the play there? <laughs> atoms is in the, the science and neutrons, electrons and all that to Adam, the actual person. We could get it too into the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which had a God called Autumn, yeah. which is, that's a whole rabbit hole. Wow. But the Egyptian Book of the Dead, they all come from, there's only two religions. And this is where, what I inevitably realized. Um, we're, we're writing books as external hard drives for our failing minds. Mm -hmm. And so as technology increases, it's a crutch for the de-evolution of the human intellect. Mm -hmm. They didn't need it back then. And so not only was their mind stronger, so it was more accurate because it was more preserved in their mind, yeah. they, they held the actual interpretation, not just the literal. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, and um, for instance, there's two types of thought processes. There's convergent and divergent. Mm -hmm. Convergent is where you take facts and you converge them into a central worldview. Mm -hmm. Sounds like everyone should do that, except the resulting worldview is only as good as the facts that were put in. So yeah. it's garbage in, garbage out. Right. And so you end up with this confident worldview that may be based on bad rocks, like mm -hmm. bad rocks in the parable of the sower is, mm -hmm. is, is kind of what that's referring to. And this goes back to a concept by Dawkins called memes, not like a social media meme, but right. mimetic or from the word memory. Mm -hmm. But then you have divergent thought. Divergent thought is where you start with a central question, but you ask questions out on the peripheries, so scientific versus philosophical. Yeah. And so the, what I, the way I form my worldview, um, not to say that I'm right, but I think this is is correct. I merge those two together, which is called lateral thinking. Mm -hmm. It's convergent and divergent. And so what happens is you take facts and you converge them into a central worldview. And then you question the facts, hold all thoughts captive to Christ. And you look for, que you question everything out in the periphery again. And so it's like this convergent, divergent, convergent. It's almost like an inhale, exhale. Yeah. And so your worldview becomes like this living, breathing thing. And I started to analyze all the books with that. I read the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu Bible, although it's a way of life, so they don't say Bible. Mm -hmm. I read the um, Book of Mormon, all three Bibles, the 66 of the Protestant, the 72 of the Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, Apocrypha, and the 84 of the Ethiopian canon, including like the Book of Enoch and all this, the Nag Hammadi Library, and just pretty much everything I could get my hands on. Still working through the Jewish Talmud. You were obsessive. Well, I wanted to figure out if... <laughs> Yes. I actually was like addicted to sin. And so I'm like, yeah. I'm looking for a reason to, to justify my sin life. And Jesus was throwing a monkey wrench into it. And yeah. I was like, I just couldn't get past him. Mm -hmm. And so I read all the books and they all told me what I wanted to hear. You're a good person. You can save yourself, live a good life, mm -hmm. do the right thing based on fill in the subjective standard of goodness, like the five pillars of Islam or whatever. And then you hold yourself up to that lower standard and now you're good and therefore your sin is now justified. Mm -hmm. You use that currency, the I'm a good person currency to pay your conscience off and the problem solved. Right. But then Jesus comes in. He's the only one that's different. He says, you're not a good person. You can't save yourself. Your works are filthy rags to God. I'm not impressed. Like God's not impressed and you need a savior because you're damned to hell and you deserve it. Mm -hmm. And so really you have the wages of sin is death, which is what Jesus says. And you have the like evil inverse of that, which is the wages of goodness is life. Mm -hmm. I am owed salvation because I'm a good person. And that's what every single religion, every they're all just denominations of the same I'm a good person religion. Right. And so I realized, okay, Jesus is the only one that's different. It's the only one I don't want to be true. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one that's true. And so I answered those first two questions of, is there a God? 
And then which one is it? And now I'm like spending the rest of my life trying to figure out like what exactly does he want from us? Yeah. Well, I hate to get so, to take something so cool and relate it to <laughs> my, my example of, you know, I was in the mortgage business for 17 yeah. years and I didn't want what I now teach to be true. Yeah. So I actually fought it. I fought it pretty mm -hmm. heavily for a year and a half. In fact, you know, my business partner, Matt Workman, that's what we did for a year and a half is we tried to disprove this whole strategy and mm -hmm. philosophy. And what we came to find out is, holy crap, yeah. that's actually the best way to do it. So yeah. it's a way that we used to do it prior to 1913. So I hate to take something that's really cool to make it financial. but It's the same thing. You, you have a baby that you want to preserve, and the best way to do it is to try to kill it. And you death yeah. proof it by almost proving its validity by, you know, I can't drown this thing. Right. So maybe, it, maybe it's the best flotation device. So I recently watched a, a podcast kind of going back to this whole, we have to question everything, right? Yeah. Bible says to. Yeah. And, you know, science, archaeologists and pathologists and all have told us that, you know, this is what we should know as fact and never question it. Yeah. Uh, because if we question it, then all of their works leading up to it yeah. were not really all for naught. And they, but, you know, people take a lot of pride in that, right? Like, no, my, you know, if this is my work, imagine if, you know, we, we finally conclude that a lot of the things that Albert Einstein was actually wrong about. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You yeah. know, the world will turn on its head. So I was listening to Jimmy Corsetti talk about how he believes. And he said, and it's really cool his take on it. He's like, I'm not saying this is what it is. Yeah. I'm just telling you this is what I believe based on facts that I've accumulated of where the lost city of Atlantis is. Yeah. And it's totally different than where anybody else has explored or thinks where the lost city of Atlantis is based on what Plato's uh, writings were. And it's actually the eye of the Sahara. You know, and I promise you, I will draw a conclusion to, to back to the Bible and Christianity. Because as I'm listening to him on Joe Rogan, every now and then they will talk about things that maybe relate to the Bible. But yeah. I listened to the whole thing and they never really brought it back home. Is It's the eye of the Sahara. And I, forget, I think it's called the Rushak or whatever, where it's like these three rings. And because the Atlantis was described as being a city surrounded by three rings of water. Mm -hmm. And then the other th question is, is, okay, well, how can it be in the Sahara? Sahara is a dry nomad desert, right? How can something that's described as being so lush, pun intended, so lush, green, and have water be in the middle of the Sahara? Yeah. Well, we know that there used to be rivers and tributaries that actually went through the Sahara. And now we're finding out that the Sahara used to be that, actually. Yeah. So you have to, again, question that, well, it, just because the Sahara is a dry, desolate desert now, has it always been that way? Right. And if you pan back uh, and look at satellite images of the Sahara, and especially the, the eye of the Sahara, which is what they think the Rushak was, and I think I'm pronouncing it right, you can see where this salt in massive erosion just kind of sweep from mm. the, the north of the Sahara down to... Uh, and again, it also, Plato talks about where Atlantis to the south of the city was the sea. Yeah. So again, the eye of the Sahara, if you look to the south of it, there's the, the ocean. So if you look at it, they said this could only have come about by a biblical flood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like the the things the like that could actually change the climate of, of an area. But it does. I mean, if you look at it, you're like that was complete water and not just water. Lots of water. And what they also discovered was that there's underground rivers close yeah. to the eye of the Sahara. And what are we talking about in the Bible? That it not only came from the sky, but also yeah. bubbled up from the earth. But I mean, it's it's almost like, how do you ignore the obvious yeah. that this was done by water and a massive tsunami of some sort came through and destroyed what you know could be the lost city of Atlantis? I I think that makes a lot of sense. So I, I've thought that too, that perhaps the Garden of Eden was in that area mm -hmm. because there's oil reserves underneath. And so the way organic chemistry works is when carbon-based uh, organisms die mm -hmm. and they get buried in the earth, they turn to oil. Mm -hmm. And so we're driving around our cars like fueled on dead dinosaurs and like, yeah. <laughs> like you know what I mean? but um, it makes sense that um, the desert and it makes biblical sense too. If you look, talk, if you look at how God deals with sin, mm -hmm. he turns it into like desolate wasteland. Your cities will be barren. If you look at um, Israel mm -hmm. just a couple hundred years ago, yeah. it's been like rocks. And then there's prophecies, I think in Isaiah and Daniel, where it says there will be vineyards again on the mountains mm -hmm. and it's happening now. Mm -hmm. 
But everyone thinks like, oh, Israel's just always, no, it's been like wasteland for a long time. Yeah. And these are biblical things where God predicted these things would happen and then he just wiped them out. And so it kind of makes sense to me that like scorched earth, kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah, mm-hmm. like it, it seems to me that uh, Atlantis or Eden or whatever mm-hmm. we want to call it would have been in that area. And that's kind of like the MO of how God works. It's like, well, since this is destroyed, we're just going to yeah. curse the land, sow salt into it. Can I get it? This was on the Joe Rogan podcast, and he's an atheist or agnostic. Um, I, I kind of still see that there's some yeah. hope there for him that, Me too. That, because he keeps questioning, right? Yeah. So if you keep questioning, eventually you're going to find the truth. Find. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, th- I think eventually he may eventually uh, turn, but they never really broke. They, they talked about, yeah, it was almost like there was like a biblical flood. Like they yeah. used it as a coin phrase as yeah. opposed to hold up. Yeah. That's actually talked about in the Bible. Yeah. And, it, and why do we continue to dispute something that continues to be proven correct? I'll tell you why. Because the Old Testament physical is the New Testament spiritual. It's a mirror. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, in the Old Testament, you have Noah. He's one man. He's a carpenter. He uses mm-hmm. nails in his hands to build a floating refuge mm-hmm. for one family to rise above the wrath of God, literally float above it, and mm-hmm. still be tossed around by the waves of it. That's what Jesus does spiritually in the New Testament. And one man, he's a carpenter with nails in his hands who builds mm-hmm. salvation for one family by his blood. Holy crap. Yeah, it's a spiritual, physical, spiritual. Yeah. And so they attack the physical narratives of the Old Testament to obscure the spiritual interpretation of the New. Uh. And so now we don't know how to navigate this invisible spiritual relationship we have with God mm-hmm. because we don't trust the Old Testament to be physically accurate. And so mm-hmm. I say take the Old Testament literally and the New Testament spiritually. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've noticed that science has a real beef with the Old Testament narratives, Mm -hmm. trying to change the timelines, trying to like, oh, well, years, a thousand days and this. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it it causes, if I hold a physical object up in front of a mirror um, and I say, hey, what is this? You'd say, Mm -hmm. well, it's a football. Mm -hmm. But if I like turn it here and like crush it and smash it and light it on fire and like you're just looking at a pile of goo, I've altered the, I've, I've altered your ability to recognize the light which is spirit, which is the reflection of it, the light of it, based on altering the physical composition of it. Mm -hmm. And so when we destroy the physical narrative of the Old Testament, it has a ripple effect to us now being confused about our spiritual relationship in the new. Yeah. Man, good stuff. Well, I appreciate you stopping by and doing this podcast. This is uh, one of the better ones. In fact, Derek, it was way better than yours uh, when you were on as a guest. So. Derek's my business partner, so we can talk about that with each other. So again, Michael, uh, thank you again. Very enlightening experience. You guys.